Well, welcome to the first church service of Generations Church for 2022. We canceled church last week and, uh, because of weather, and so we're just so glad that all of you have chosen to come out and be with us today. And welcome to our online audience as well. We're grateful that you're with us and grateful that we can minister to you and have the technology to do that. Well, I want to, um, Pastor Connie was just talking about the fast, and this is the ninth year, just to help you and uh, help you be encouraged about this a little bit. Millions, everybody say millions. Millions, millions of people are going to be fasting with us. All you've got to do is get on Google and type in 21 days of prayer and fasting, and you're going to see churches all over the world that have some kind of program about 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, it's a fad, I guess, if you want to call it a fad, but it's a good one. It's a spiritual one. It's a, it's a godly one. It's not like, I hope that bell-bottom jeans for men never come back. <clears throat> I used to wear them. I don't, I'll never, if they come back, I'll never wear them again. But anyway, sitting around you somewhere near you is a piece of paper that looks like this. And our um, declared fast dates start tomorrow through the 30th, and that is 21 days. Connie and I had a funny discussion last night about that. Uh, 10 and 30 looks like it's 20 days. That's our deal. But if you count tomorrow, it's 21 days. And uh, so anyway, so you can pick out what kind of fast you want to do. And there, there are six of them, six biblical types of fast that we've found in the scriptures. There's some fasting references, scripture references, websites, things that will help you uh, down at the bottom of this. Anything you see in red uh, other than the scripture uh, are some cautions about those types of fast. You probably need to consult a doctor before you do that. Um, the fast of sacrifice. I saw a post by someone this week that on our church Facebook page said they were fasting sodas. That's what a fast of sacrifice is. You pick something that is in your life, and you sacrifice that for 21 days, and you do it as unto God. But the real thing is you dedicate some time, everybody say time, time. to the Lord, and you, whatever time you would spend drinking that soda or whatever you're doing, you spend time with God rather than doing that particular thing. The other thing, for the first time last year we did this, we gave everyone that wanted one a folder. And in this folder, here's our theme. It's also in the bulletin. Uncommon is our fasting theme. It's the series that I'll start preaching this morning. Uh, but in this folder, they're back there on the back table, and you, they're free. You don't have to pay for it. But there's 21 days, and each day, I'm just going to flip to... Uh, this is day two. It, there's, you can write stuff here. On, there's space here. There's even a family section that you can do something with your kiddos every day. And, but there's scripture. But it's the idea is that all of us as a church are praying the same thing at the same time. Whether you pray uh, over these things in the morning or whether you do it at night before you go to bed or whether you do it at lunch. At some point, we're in agreement. Amen? Amen? And so I'm enthusiastic about this. So you pick one out, and if we run out, there'll be more next Sunday. Well, it looks, I'm looking back there at the table, and the first service took quite a few, and there's quite a few more people here today. But you can do it. I, it doesn't have to be one per couple. You could, every individual could get one. And if we run out, I'll have more for you next Sunday. The other thing that I'm kind of excited about, and maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just goofy Pastor Ed. But we are going to do a t-shirt with Uncommon on it. It's blue with white. And uh, I just feel like when you put it on, you'll think about it. It has this Uncommon logo on it. The same thing that's on the screen up there, except it's white. And then we're going to have car decals. So you can put them on the back of your car as well. People, it's just going to say Uncommon. Some will say, well, what does that mean? Well, you get to tell them, I'm an uncommon Christian. I'm a Christ follower, and I'm different. And uh, you can use it as a tool to witness. I don't know. I don't, if, now, if you put this on your, it doesn't say the church's name on it. Uh, that's why, I, sometimes I drive crazy. That's why I don't I put bumper stickers on my car. <laughs> if you resemble that remark, no, don't raise your hand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
If you're, if you're ever tempted to give somebody half a peace sign, don't put it on your car. Yeah, some of you are going to have to think about that a minute. What's half a peace sign? You'll figure it out. Anyway, why are you shaking your head at me? Men, do your wives ever shake their head at you? Okay, I, thank you, Adrian. That makes me feel better. Anyway, like Connie, like Pat, my wife, I am excited about uh, prayer and fasting time. It does give you and I a chance to refocus, uh, to remove some of the things out of our lives that are distractions and help us get back to where we know we're supposed to be with the Lord and get on the right track. You know, if, you know, it's just been a tough season for all of us, and um, I think this will really help us focus as I said, our series for the next four Sundays is Uncommon. Please say Uncommon with me. Uncommon. Say it again, uncommon. uncommon. I don't know what comes to your mind when you think about that word. For me, uh, sometimes I think about maybe an antique, something that is very valuable, that's uncommon, that, that people don't have very much of or something like that. I think of the word different as well. And all of those words uh, apply to us as Christ followers today. Uh, when we genuinely follow Jesus, we're different. Everybody look at the person on your right and left and say, you're different. Yeah. Now, don't, don't say that in the way that some of I saw some of, saw some of you look at, yeah, you're different, all right. <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> Let's stand to our feet and read God's word together. I'll put it up on the, it's up on the screen. This, these two verses, I'm not really going to preach about them or through them today. I will in the future, but I want to introduce you to them. The first one, Exodus chapter 34 and verse 10. Let me set the stage a moment. We know that in Exodus chapter 32, Moses got the Ten Commandments for the first time. He went up on the mountain. The finger of God wrote Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. And while he was up there, uh, Aaron sinned, rebelled. He said the people made him do it. How I many of you know that's a lie? Um, but he made a golden calf. They began to idol worship. Exodus 33, God was ticked. I mean, God was ready to destroy this nation of mil millions of people for their sin and their rebellion. He had redeemed them out of the nation of Egypt. They had even been water baptized through the Red Sea. The symbolism is there. And... He says, I'm not going with you anymore. And Moses says in Exodus chapter 34, he says, if you don't go with us, I'm not going. I'm not going to be their leader. I won't do it. And God says, I'm going to start over. I'm going to renew the covenant with you. And so he goes back up on the mountain and he gets the Ten Commandments again. And when it's all said and done, here's the promise that God gave Moses. And if you know, God is the God of another chance. Come on. The Lord replied, listen, I'm making a covenant with you in the presence of all your people. I will perform miracles that have never been performed anywhere in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people around you will see the power of the Lord, the awesome power I will display for you. Wow. Wow. I believe that. I believe that God wants to do something so uncommon among us that it even blows us away and everybody around us, they're amazed by the miracle working power of God among us. Can somebody say amen? amen. And then we go over to the New Testament and Peter says this, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, you're pretty special. Again, don't say it in that weird way. <laughs> Some of you are sitting with your family and you're going, I know you're special. <laughs> you know, the, the old King James Bible uses that verse and it says it this way. It says, you're a peculiar people. Amen. I know Christ followers have to use that verse just as an excuse to be weird. <laughs> we are different. We are different. Amen. And God has chosen us to be uncommon. And look, look at the reason why that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't that special? 
Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word today, that it's alive, it's quick, it's sharp, it's more powerful than any two-edged sword. Lord, I pray that you help me speak your word with clarity and with authority. Lord, I believe that you're the vine and I'm the branch, Lord, and without you, I can do nothing. I am totally dependent upon your Holy Spirit to help me speak today. And Lord, may these words be encouraging, insightful. Lord, may these words be life-changing, not because they're my words, but because they're your words. Lord, why men and women and children and people online, may they hear God's voice today through my voice. And Father, I will promise to give you all the glory and the honor and the praise for what you do as a result of your spoken word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. you can be seated. On the back side of your bulletin is an outline that you can follow along and you can fill it out. And We've already done several of the blanks, the fasting guide, the fasting journal. I've already put those on there, and you've seen that on the screen. I want to say just a couple of comments about fasting and the uncommon facts. The fast that we're about to embark on is not a fast to prove how spiritual you are. You're not trying to prove to anybody who you are or what you are. You're, the fast is between you and God. Nobody on this staff, nobody on this stage will ever come and ask you, what are you fasting? How much are you fasting? It's none of their business. And if anybody does, you just need to look at them a little sideways. It is not a fast to lose weight. That might be a result, but that's not the reason we're fasting. It's popular these days to fast to lose weight. However, it is a fast to draw closer to God in a way to draw closer to God, but also draw away from the world. It is also a fast to hear His voice better than we hear the voice of the world. It is also a fast to go deeper than just surface Christianity. It is a fast that should pull you deeper into the heart and the things of God. And you know, there, being uncommon is something that I, I preached this sermon probably 20 years ago. I'm not going to preach it to you today. I'm going to show you the four points of this sermon because I still believe, basically and foundationally, these are the things that make us uncommon. Number one. What makes us uncommon, and there, these are in your outline, is we are moved by something that we cannot see. God's Holy Spirit lives in you. You can't touch it. You can't handle it. You can't take it off the shelf and say, I want more of it. God's Holy Spirit is poured into you supernaturally. You can feel it, but you can't see it. And it moves you. It moves me. It moves me during worship. It moves me when I read the Word of God. It moves me when I attend conferences. It moves me when I hear others preach. I get moved sitting in my office listening to a podcast or something because I can feel the power of the Holy Spirit coming through that. I'm moved by something that I cannot see. That makes me uncommon. Only if you're a Christ follower do you understand that. Number two. We live by and believe in something very old but very fresh. It's called the Bible. It's still, hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, this is still the number one best-selling book in the world. And it is what moves us. We believe in it. We live by it. We base our life on it. Yes, it is very old, but it is very fresh. There are things, there are things going on in our world today that are not talked about in the Bible. But the principles are there how to deal with it. I've always cited, when I talk about this, a blended family. God's Word never planned for a blended family. His kids, her kids, and our kids. It's not in here. But you know how you handle a blended family? You handle it by the principles of the Word of God. You love one another. You forgive one another. The principles in the Bible teach you how to live in a blended family. Amen? Amen. Even though it wasn't planned for. So we live by, believe in something very old but very fresh. Number three, these things make you and I uncommon as Christ followers. We are tested. Or in other words, we're in a fight and we have no visible means of defense, nor do we have visible weapons. We don't fight with guns, knives, and bombs. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he said, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I remember a testimony, and the story is way too long to tell. We experienced this on the beach a few years ago with our family and grandkids. We were talking to a man. God blinded my eyes. I, did, I should have known who he was. He's very famous. He was a very famous minister, a very famous prophet. And we were talking to our grandkids, and he started telling my grandkids his testimony. 
And his testimony was that he was a drug addict. He went to prison for selling and dealing drugs. He came out of prison, gave his life to Christ. And he, a, a drug dealer that he'd made a bad drug deal with in the past somewhere, found him, wanted to kill him and shoot him. He was 10 feet away with a 9mm gun. He emptied the clip of the 9mm gun 10 feet away and not a bullet hit him. And from that moment on, he said, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm telling you what, friends, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down. God can do things in you, through you, and for you that are owned because he's an uncommon God and he made you uncommon. Amen? Amen. So we, that's the third thing that makes us uncommon. We fight in a battle where we don't have any visible weapons. We have a sword of the Spirit. We believe and trust in the promises of God. Number four, we live to give and we live to serve. That makes you and I different. Now, that might be convicting to you. That might be something you say, well, no, I don't know about that. I don't know. I live with a woman that she doesn't know how to say no. She lives to give. She lives to serve. And I find myself doing things and saying things and going places like, really? And I'm sure she says the same thing about me. But it's what, it's, it's our Christianity. It's, it's who we are. We, we live to give and we live to serve. And that makes you and I pretty uncommon. Jesus said if you want to save your life, you've got to lose it. We live to give. I wrote this next piece Sat down. I'm not much of a writer. I don't fancy myself as a, as a writer. But I feel like I got kind of inspired writing this piece. Next Sunday, on the back table back there, this will be out in paper form for you to put up somewhere or in your Bible or somewhere that you can read it every day. It'll be on, I think it took three slides to get it on the screen. We serve an uncommon God who created the world and everything in it. This uncommon God made an uncommon sacrifice to have a relationship with his creation after they disobeyed him. Our uncommon God's uncommon sacrifice was his uncommon son, who was uncommon by living a sinless, perfect life, yet he died an uncommon criminal's death so that you and I could have an uncommon life. In the end, this uncommon God who sent his uncommon son to die an uncommon death for us so that we can live an uncommon life will come again and get us and take us to an uncommon eternity. Amen? Amen? I think that would be worth you keeping and remembering. So knowing that you and I are uncommon, I want to tell you a story. I, was, I find stories all the time and I, I have a file that just says illustrations and I put stories and this is an illustration. During the 45 year career of Ludwig van Beethoven wrote 722 symphonies, sonatas, and concertos. You may know many of those compositions were written after Beethoven had gone deaf. When he first noticed his hearing loss, Beethoven was devastated. Unable to hear the music he made, life felt meaningless. At first, Beethoven played so loudly that he injured his hands because he played so loudly on the piano. Not to mention, he injured the ears of those who were listening. Eventually, he was unable, he was able to not, not only adapt to his hearing loss, but also to innovate new sound. An analysis that was done of Beethoven's music by the British Medical Journal reveals that high notes accounted for 80% of his music in his 20s, but only 20% of his music in the 40, in his 40s. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, Symphony ranks as one of his greatest musical achievements, and it starts with a series of notes that have become iconic. Now, I'm going to say these. I am not a musician. They don't mean anything to me. Some of you might be able to put them to music, but here's what it says. Da, 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 dumb. I don't know what that means, but it says the article that I was reading said that was an amazing thing. It was written after Beethoven had lost, completely lost his hearing. How is that even possible? One author, Arthur Brooks, said this, As his hearing deteriorated, he was less influenced by the prevailing compositional fashions or fads and more by the musical structure forming on the inside of his head. 
Instead of being influenced by the musical trends of his day, Beethoven trusted his internal voice. He composed out of his musical convictions. My friends, if we're going to be successful in 2022, we've got to live by our convictions, not our conveniences. We've got to live out of our convictions, not our preferences. Life has been so hard for the last two years that we're just looking for the path of least resistance and looking for the easiest way to live. And that's not necessarily where God's blessing is. God's blessing is, I believe, is when we follow him like on a 21-day fast. Some of you may be saying, Pastor, I've never fasted a day in my life. I've never sacrificed anything. Listen, God might be speaking to you today. My friend online, God might be speaking to you because it's it's not the path of the least resistance. It's not the easiest way where we find the most blessings. It's in obedience that we find the most blessings from God. I've been asking myself this question lately. And I, I qualify lately by the last three to four weeks because I knew what I was going to be preaching on that long ago. And I've been asking myself this question. It'll appear on the screen. What percentage of your thoughts, words, and actions are a regurgitation of the media you're watching and the social media you're following? And what percentage is a revelation uh, you're getting straight from God's Word? I've been asking myself that question. And there's a reason for it. Because you and I are bombarded by breaking news. I don't know about you, but I've got notifications on my phone, uh, notifications from Facebook, notifications from Twitter, Instagram. I have really got some notifications from ESPN. It got to where I had to shut my phone off at night because laying on my bed stand, my ESPN at night was going ding, 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 and Connie couldn't sleep, and I would sleep right through it. She said, what in the world is on your phone? You say, Pastor, is that wrong? Is that evil? Is that bad? Not necessarily, but what I'm saying is online advertisers Algorithms, social media, things that you're looking at, polls, opinions. Are those things the things that are shaping your thoughts? Because we all know, all of us listening to the sound of my voice, what you think about is where you're headed. What you're thinking about is where you're headed. Let me just give you an example. Not long ago, I was looking for some new earbuds to use when I worked out at the gym so I could listen to music or listen to my Bible because the ones I had were not staying in my ears very good. And so I started looking at Amazon and looking at different Google, you know, just finding different ones. Well, not long. I found the ones I wanted pretty quickly. Bought them, ordered them, still using them today. But for several weeks on Instagram, on Facebook, on uh, Google, Earbuds were showing up in my feeds. Different kinds of earbuds. And you know what they call that, don't you? They call it clickbait. They want you to click on it again. Advertise. I even have a solitaire game on my phone where I'm just sitting there playing solitaire. I was getting earbud clickbait on my solitaire game. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Well, see... Here's what happens. Social media follows where you're headed. And I'm a little concerned that some of us, if it flashed on the big screen, what you've been thinking about and what you've been searching, would you be pleased? Would God be pleased? What clickbait you've been following. How the world, the outside world, is shaping your thoughts rather than the revelation you're getting from God's Word. Rather than the instructions that you're getting from God's Word. My new Read Through the Bible Year plan that I chose to do this year, there's about 18 or 19 people 
Uh, matter of fact, Pastor Steve Corona is going to be our speaker for our Holy Spirit Conference. His son, Micah, invited me to be a part of this Bible reading plan. And all of these people, including myself, after we read it, there's a place that says, talk the story. And you click on that and you get to write what spoke to you. And it's been so refreshing to write what speaks to me, but also to read what God is speaking to other people through the same passage that I just got through reading. You see, you've got to decide. Where are you going to get your information from? Where are you going to get your direction from? And in this world, you've got to de- if you're going to do that, you've got to decide. That's what the title of this is today. You've got to decide what your convictions are. Over the last three or four weeks, I've taken the time, took me some time, to write down my seven core convictions. Number one, I want to be famous at home. I don't want to be famous in Lubbock. I don't want to be famous on national TV. I want to be famous at home. I've had my 15 minutes of fame. I've been on Dr. Phil. (laughs) I've done documentaries, four different documentaries uh, about teenagers and stuff. I've done that stuff. I want to be famous at home. Number two, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Only. You heard me right. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says there's no other name under heaven by which man can be saved. There's, I, it is non-negotiable. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Amen. John chapter 14 and verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Number three, the Word of God, I've already said this, has all the answers. Number four, brag about people behind their back. Now, we talk about people behind their back all the time. I said brag about people behind their back. I double-dog dare you, men. Brag about your wife when she's not in the room. Brag about your wife behind her back. It'll get back to her, I promise you. Number five, never lose a holy curiosity. Never think you've arrived spiritually. Always be hungry. Always be growing in the things of God. Amen? Amen? I'm just so excited today. We were baptizing two young ladies. They're teen, young girls. One's a preteen. One is a teen. And I'm just, it's just so, I can't express to you enough the importance of making commitments when you're young. Number six, playing it safe is risky. <laughs> You've just got to take a risk every now and then. Connie said that a while ago. I, I've taken her on more risky things than she probably cares to remember. But uh, it's true. It's a conviction. Live for the applause of nail-scarred hands. I could have said it this way because I've said it so many times that live your life for an audience of one. But I chose to put in the extra descriptor of live for the applause of the one who died for you. Make him happy. Let me tell you what, friends. I'm going to tell you right now. If you're a guest or if this is your second or third time here, I, I, I'm not trying to be weird, but I'm going I'm to tell you, I am Ed and I'm your friend. I love you enough to tell you the truth. If you're trying to make everybody else happy, you're miserable. You're a miserable human being. And I don't mean bad. I mean you're just not feeling good. Because making everybody happy is impossible. You make him happy, you'll make everybody around you happy. And the ones that you don't make happy, tough beans. I can prove that to you by Scripture. Proverbs 16, 7, Wendy says this. If your ways are pleasing to the Lord, even your enemies will be at peace with you. That's a biblical, scriptural promise. Amen? Amen? I want to share two more convictions with you. They are not mine. These are Pastor Mark Batterson from Washington, D.C. They were so good in my research, I just had to share them with you. He said these two convictions are his. There were, he had more, but these are two I wanted to quote. If you do little things like they are big things, God will do big things like they are little things. Come on, somebody. Luke 16, 10, if you're faithful in small things, he'll make you faithful over big things. Man, friends, we've got to be faithful in the little stuff. 
Number two, his second one was when you stay humble and stay hungry, there's nothing God cannot do in, in you or through you. Both of those, my spirit just leapt when I read them, and I just said, amen, i got to share these things. They're too good not to share with God's people. I've had the joy and the privilege of being in full-time ministry here in Lubbock, Texas since 1981. In the last 15 of those years, I've been the lead pastor right here at Generations Church. These last two years, though, have been difficult. I'm your pastor. I'm, tell- I'm not going to soft sell. It's been a difficult season. It's been a challenging season, yet it's also, I want to tell you, it's also been very rewarding. Right here in Lubbock, Texas, we've experienced the victory of becoming the sanctuary city for the unborn. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've also seen the devastating effects of COVID. We've seen the polarization of politics, but we have also innovated and adopted and reinvented ourselves in many, many ways. Still, Still, things are not back to where they were. Maybe they'll never get there, and maybe that's a good thing because God has changed us and is changing us. I think online church is here to stay. What do you think? I think innovating and reaching people through innovative methods is here to stay. I mean, just because we're, we're on the radio every week on Friday with our committed couples, just because we're on Facebook Live very often with prayer times, you know what? Our message will never change just because we're using different methods. It's, we don't have, just because, you know, I've got pastor friends. This thing, this new stuff, I don't want to learn anything new. Man, I'm 64 years old and I'm still learning new stuff. Or about to be 64, let me rephrase. But you know what? We've got to get to the place that we understand that reinventing, innovating is a good thing. We don't want to stay the same. But have our basic core convictions that don't change even though we're reinventing and innovating. Nod your head at me if you understand what I'm saying. One of the horrible things that have come with this last two years is isolation. I've got friends that would tell you they've heard me preach about isolation for 25 years. I used to say to teenagers when I was a full-time youth pastor and traveling and speaking to kids, I would quote Proverbs 18.1. If I didn't quote it in every sermon, it was nearly every sermon. Because Proverbs 18.1 says this, A man who isolates himself rages against all sound wisdom and sound judgment. When you live in isolation, when you live isolated from people, you're asking for trouble. I didn't say this in the first service, but I want to just point it out to you just because I feel the, the unction to do so. But I remember working with young people, and I would see a young, a young man and a young lady start dating, and then they, they, would, they would be friendly in the group, and they would be social butterflies and getting around with everybody, and all of a sudden they'd be boyfriend and girlfriend, and the next thing you know, they're not going out to eat with anybody else, they're not doing anything with anybody else, it's just them, 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 and all their other friends are, you know, it's just these two. Well, the next thing you know, they're in trouble. Why? They've isolated themselves from accountability. They've isolated themselves from fellowship. And the next thing you know, they're tempted sexually. They're tempted in other ways because there's no accountability. It's why we taught our kids, all three of our children, we taught them to group date. Both, all three of our children didn't have individual, single, one-on-one dates with anybody until they were 17 or older. Because we knew the dangers of isolation. Amen? Some of you young people are going, shut up right now. (laughs) Oops, too late. I'm just telling you, you you carry that into adulthood. You isolate yourself off from the place that can get you the most help. You're in trouble. Listen, coming to church is not going to get you to heaven. If you believe coming to church will get you to heaven, go home tonight, sleep in your garage, and in the morning you'll wake up and be a car. You're like, that's stupidity. Exactly. Coming to church will not make you a Christ follower. You've got to make a decision. You've got to decide. 
to follow Jesus. And then once you follow Jesus, you got to rub shoulders with other people that are following Jesus. Because we encourage each other. We help each other. We strengthen each other. Amen? So, moving forward, I want to share three simple ideas that I learned in 2021 that I'm taking with me into 2022. And you could say they're convictions of a sort. Number one, my, our communication is never enough and it's always too much. Say, so, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, I could always talk about Jesus more, right? My communication is never enough. I can always do more. I can always share my faith more often, whether it's in print, whether it's speech, or whether it's uh, posting. I made a commitment that years ago, and you can go check my social media out. I don't post anything unless it's encouraging. I just don't do it. My words that go out on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, they are encouraging words because it's never enough. There's never enough encouragement in the world. But it's also too much. Cancel culture is real, isn't it? How many of you know, because his words weren't very encouraging, we had a past president that got canceled. He had problems with Proverbs 18:21. Serious problems. You say, what's Proverbs 18, 21? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Well, he's eating its fruit. He thought it was his duty to tear everybody down via Twitter or Facebook, and he suffered the consequences. I, it's my conviction, maybe not yours, I'm just going to tell you. I'll, I'll step away from the pulpit here. This is Pastor Ed. This is not thus saith the Lord. I believe that's why he lost the election. Because they lost the power to exhort and encourage people. No matter what side of the aisle you believe or you come down on it, that's just my opinion. I believe that if he had learned the power to use the power of his words to exhort and encourage and strengthen, he might, maybe, I don't know, might still be our president. But instead he used his words to rip and tear and destroy and criticize and hate. I don't know. Words matter, folks. If you're sitting next to your spouse, look at them and say, words matter. I'm going to tell you something. It's not just words. It's body language. Communication matters, doesn't it, Connie? It makes a difference in your marriage. It makes a difference with your kids. Look at what Jesus said about the power of your words. And this is, man, this is tough stuff, man. Look at me. I'm Ed. I'm your friend. I didn't write this. I just read it. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account. Every idle word you may speak or post. I think we need to add that in there, right? They will give an account in the day of judgment, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Of course, Jesus was no stranger to this idea. The Pharisees were baiting him and trolling him nonstop. But Jesus lived by the 12th commandment. You say, what's that? Thou shalt always offend Pharisees. He said, what's the 11th commandment? Well, it's a preacher-only commandment. Thou shalt not bore. (laughs) Number two, as a leader, and by the way, you say, why are you addressing it as a leader? I see every one of you online, every one of you in this room, you're a leader. At the very lowest level of leadership, you are leading your own life. And the way you lead your own life is the way you influence your wife. It's the way you influence your kids. It's the way you influence your employees. It's the way you influence your employer. You're a leader whether you like it or not. If if you name Jesus as your Savior, you're a leader. People are watching you. I'm just going to tell you as parents, you've got paparazzi and you didn't know it. You've got kids that are 24-7, 365, taking pictures of you. They're remembering everything you say and everything you do. They're remembering the way you do it and how you do it. They know what's in your refrigerator, whether I do or not. Come on, somebody. As a leader, I reserve the right 
to get smarter later. What does that mean? It means you never stop learning. I love 2 Peter chapter 1. The first four verses talk about how the promises of God are available to all of us. And in verse 5, he goes on, he says, In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence. With moral excellence, with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patience, patient endurance, and patient endurance with gladness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. All it's saying is you can take all of those things, and all you're doing is you're stacking one attribute on top of the other, and you're growing and growing and growing and getting better. Whether it's faith, whether it's knowledge, whether it's self-control, whether it's endurance, whether it's godliness, whether it's love, you're just getting better and better and better. You're not staying stagnant. And look at what verse 8 and 9 said. And I didn't get to this in the first service, so y'all are special. Look at this. It says, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you are. Wow! When you reserve the right to get smarter later, you're going to get more productive. And you're going to get better. Amen? But, verse 9, he's not finished. Again, I have to say this. I am Ed. I'm your friend. I didn't write it. I just read it. But those who fail to develop in these, this way, they are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their own sins. Church, I don't want to be stuck. I don't care what the chaos that's going on in the world, the stuff that's going on in politics, or the stuff that's going on in social media. I do not want to be stuck. I want to keep growing. I want to keep being challenged. This world, there we are in the minority. Christ followers are in the minority in this world. There is a task that we haven't finished. And when people have hit rock bottom, they're looking for answers. We have it. We have the answer. We are the light. We are the city set on a hill. We are the hope of the world. Jesus lives in us. I ran across a verse in my studies, and I was astounded that I'd never seen this in the Bible. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 2. He who thinks he knows does not yet know as he ought to know. <laughs> Look at don't say anybody's name. Don't point at anybody. Please, don't elbow anybody. Does anybody know a know-it-all? If you know a know-it-all, send them this verse. Because <laughs> it will tell them, no, you don't know everything. You know, I'm being, trying to be a little humorous here by saying that, but I just realized the older I get, the less I know. I mean, this whole COVID thing and all the stuff that's going on, everything's way, 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 way above my pay grade. I'm, I'm going to tell you a motto I live by. And those that are, I don't know how many of them are still here. Some of them may be in the first service. Those that are on my leadership team that meet with me every Tuesday morning at 1130, we sit around two tables right here, and we plan and pray and seek God about the, how we're going to implement ministry at Generations Church. About seven or eight of us. Sometimes there's nine. I believe this. If I've got to be the smartest person at the table, I'm sitting at the wrong table. You understand what I'm saying? These people are wise. They're smart. They're a great team. And, and I'll just give you a great example. This logo right here in the bottom right-hand corner, this uncommon. I came to the meeting and said, this is going to be our theme. This is what we're going to do. It's going to be on everything we print. We're going to do a wall decal. We're going to take this one down and do a new wall decal. We're going to make some changes. And I said, had this idea. I want to do a T-shirt like I was telling you all earlier. I want to do a, a, a card decal that looks like this where you can take it and put it on your, your car and get people. And they were going, okay, okay. But they had all these changes they wanted to make to my idea. And I'm just sitting there going, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. I could have bowed up my back and said, well, that wasn't my idea, bless God. We're going to do it my way. 
No, my motto is, if I have to be the smartest person at the table, I'm sitting at the wrong table. I wanted to do a gold shirt with black uncommon. They said, no, that's ugly. We want to do a blue shirt with a white uncommon. I said, great. You say, no, Pastor, are you, are you always like? No, there's things that I hear God about, and I say, this is the way it's going to be. For instance, the theme itself. I didn't put that up for debate. God's spoken to me about calling this church and this people to be an uncommon people. That wasn't up for debate. But how we present it was great. And I'll guarantee you, I'm not the smartest person at the table. Number three, these are convictions that I'm from, the things I've learned from 2021 that I'm taking into 2022. As a husband and father, grandfather and pastor, success is when those who know me best respect me most. Wow. Kind of goes back to what I said. I, I want to be famous in my home. I want my grandkids and someday my great-grandkids to look at me and say, Pop, you're my hero. Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting in the Lord means safety. That's from the New Living Translation, the old New King James, or King James says this, The fear of man is a snare, but he who trusts in God is safe. Now we know what a trap is. It's sneaky, it's deceitful. Listen, if you... If you want to make everybody happy, look at this quote. I've got it. I, I, I'll come back to the scripture in a minute. Look at this quote. I've got it for you on the screen. It says this, you can please all of the people some of the time, some of the people all of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. I've decided in my life, and this was in my seven convictions, that I want to please the one who has nail-scarred hands. I want to live my life for an audience of one. The fear of man is a trap. The fear of man is a snare. The fear of man is dangerous to your spiritual life. If you're trying to make others happy, you may miss the boat and not make him happy. The word safe. The fear of man is a snare. But you trust in the Lord is safe. It's a Hebrew word that means you take it, you take something of value, and you put it in a place of inaccessibility to danger. Now, I relate to that. Not much anymore, but when our grandkids were younger and they were under two, there were several things in our home that we would pick up and we would put it in a place where it was inaccessible to danger. Because how many of you have heard of the terrible twos? Things that were of value to us that we didn't want our grandkids messing with or breaking, we would get them out of the way and put them safe. Well, listen, here's the promise of God. When you trust God, when you put your hope, your confidence, your faith, your trust in who God is and what God can do and what his word says he'll do for you, and when you put your hope and confidence in these promises, you're going to be safe. But if you're trying to make your young people, if you're trying to please this crowd or that crowd or that group or get in to be friends with them or you're at work and you're trying to hook up, hook up or you're trying to make this group happy in the break room, listen, you're in trouble. It is dangerous. Make God happy. The one with nail-scarred hands. Make him happy. You know, Moses, we've already talked about this a little bit. Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments, and he came down. I mean, he, he came back with stone tablets that God had wrote on supernaturally. But he wasn't, still wasn't the most popular guy in town, was he? Experts say, this is secular information, so I quantify it. I read this in Forbes magazine. 16% of people in most groups are resistors. They don't go with the new idea. They may not say it. 
They may not be vocal, but they're resisting. As a pastor, I can tell who's with it and who's not. Who's resisting the idea and who's on board, usually. Especially when change comes. Doesn't mean they're bad people. Certainly not bad people. It just means that you've got an opportunity to refine your vision. You may convince them. You may win them over. You may not. But you can win their respect by the way you treat them. You know, here... <laughs> oh, Lord, forgive me if this is sarcastic. <laughs> and maybe you know... When I stand on the judgment seat, before the judgment seat of Christ, you're not going to be on the throne judging me. And I'm not going to be on the throne judging you. Somebody say hallelujah. Thank God Connie's not going to be on there. Amen? Before I move on, I've got one more quote. Once again, I'm quoting Mark Batterson. I just couldn't get away from this quote. It convicted me. It hit me right between the eyes. He said, if you live off compliments, you will eventually die by criticism. Now think about what that means. And I, you know, confession's good for the soul and bad for the reputation. As a preacher, I love the compliments. I love people patting me on the back saying, good message, Pastor. Way to go. As an athlete, I loved it when my coach would, man, good job. Good job. You know, but if you live by the compliments, the first time somebody criticizes you, you're like, oh. So you got to figure out who you are. Does your, are you going to live by other people, what other people think about you, or are you going to live by what he, do you want to hear his well done? Or do you want to hear their well done? Because if you, can, if you can get over the idea that somebody can criticize you, and you know, the old saying, you, you all know what the old saying about criticism is, don't you? Eat the meat and throw away the bones. But sometimes the meat's a little tough to digest, isn't it? I've had more than my share of criticism because I've chosen to be in the ministry. and Back in the days, I spent, I spent 26 years traveling and speaking in public schools outside of church, completely working in the church, but also working outside the church and speaking in high schools, colleges, and stuff about abstinence, not having sex until you're married. I've had newspaper articles written about me. I've had uh, exposés done. If, if you happen to Google my name, even still to this day, even though I hadn't done it in years, there's a bunch of people that hate my ever-loving guts. And, um, you know, I remember all the years that I did it in Hobbs, in your hometown. And uh, one of the great, one of the success stories is that when <clears throat> Alice Gallagher, the head of the nursing department in Hobbs Independent School District, came over to my office at Church on the Rock and said, I've heard about you. I want you to help me design a program to teach our kids about abstinence. And I, she laid out for me, she said, in Lee County, which includes Lovington, and I'm talking about New Mexico here, not Texas, forgive me, but in Lee County, 36% of our teenage girls between the ages of 12 and 18 have either currently are pregnant or have been pregnant. One out of every three. And she said, we're in trouble. We need someone like you. And I said, so we talked and we conversed and I decided and we decided together that I was going to be the sharp end of the stick. I was going to come in and stir everybody up. And then they were going to do a program after that called Worth the Wait. W-O-R-T-H for the W-A-I-T. Great program. We did that program. I, I spoke in Hobbs Independent School District for over 15 years in a row. And I'll never forget, after the 10-year anniversary, the newspaper in Hobbs came out with a front-page article that said, first of all, it talked about how much money they had spent on the program. But thank, and it was a huge amount of money in 10 years. But they said their pregnancy rate had gone from 36% to 
to 11. Say, so what? I can stand the criticism on a deal like that. Because why? I can be narrow-minded because I know I'm right. Hello? Keep sex in marriage and it protects you physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. And guess what? That wasn't Pastor Ed's idea. That's God's idea. I just had to stand up and say it like I'm the smartest man on the planet because I couldn't use my Bible in school. But it wasn't my idea. You say, what, what, what does that have to do with this? I don't know why I'm spending so much. Maybe some of you need to, maybe some of you are living your life off of the compliments of everybody else. And when someone criticizes you, you fall apart. When you live your life off his well done and not everybody else's well done, you don't fall apart when the criticism comes. You say, Jesus, was that right? Do I need to change there? Because he'll let you know. Amen? I guess I spent that much time on that because maybe somebody needed it because I don't, I don't feel bad about it. I feel good about it. I want to close today by telling you a story about a friend of mine. He's a fellow minister. He's younger than me. He's in his 40s. He's very successful. And he was telling me the other day that he, he has a practice of meeting with elders, meaning not elders in his church, people that are older than him. And he always asked them one question, and he was asking this 82-year-old former minister, he asked the same question to every elder, every older person that he meets with. He says, what is God saying to you? And this older gentleman said back to him, very simply, having done all to stand, stand. He quoted Paul out of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. He said, this is what God's saying to me. Is saying, and I believe that, that that story resonated so much inside me that as we end this service today, this first service of 2022 for Generations Church, that my friend, no matter what you're going through, having done all to stand, keep standing. Don't quit. Don't stop. Yes, it's been difficult. Yes, it's been hard. Yes, there's been challenges. But listen to me. Discover what your core convictions are and live by them and be uncommon. Recognize that your communication, your words matter. Sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes it's too much. Secondly, recognize that you reserve the right to get smarter later. Keep learning. And keep this as a conviction. That you're as a husband, father, mother, wife, whatever you put yours, you're, I'm putting mine in there. That success is when those who know you best respect you the most. If you can learn to do those things and live by your convictions and keep standing and keep standing and keep standing, you know what it amounts to? Look what I, I have up there. Success is, is those who know me best respect me the most. That's what success is. But listen to this. Here's the answer. Long obedience. Long, long obedience. Keep on keeping on. I put two comments in my message at the very end because I believe they're prophetic. Number one is this, and it'll come up on the screen. And you need to listen carefully because this might be for some of you specifically. That's how I felt it. That's how I received it into my, my spirit when I was working on my outline today. Is that this phrase, this sentence, this set of sentences. Don't give up the ground you gained. Keep standing on the promises of God. Yes, even in difficulty, some of you have gained some ground. You've grown spiritually. You've grown. You've grown. Don't go backwards. Don't give up the ground that you took back from the enemy and said, no, no, no. Say, no, no, devil. I'm going to keep on growing. I don't know who that's for, but you need to. Maybe you're online and you need to hear that. Keep the ground that you've gained. The second prophetic word that I want to share with you. 
touched my screen and it did funky stuff. Is this. Don't be in such a hurry to get out of your current circumstances that you don't get anything from them. Some people, now listen to me, look at me. Some people are uncoordinated with the season they're in. If you move out of your season, you you say, I'm done with that season before that season's done with you. Come on. Did you hear what I just said? Some of you are done with the season, but the season's not done with you. You've got stuff you need to learn. You've got character you need to change. That's why you're in what you're in. So stay coordinated with the season that you're in. And learn what you have to learn from it. And these are two prophetic things that, that, that God put in my spirit and I put them in my notes. I want to close with a story before I pray for you. As you can tell, I'm an avid reader and I read these stories and keep them for the right moment. <laughs> On September 7th, 1892, a boxer named Gentleman Jim Corbett entered the ring with arguably the greatest boxer of all time, John L. Sullivan. John L. Sullivan was a heavyweight champion of bare-knuckle boxing and the first heavyweight champion of gloved boxing. In 50 fights, he was undefeated. The only fight Sullivan ever lost was this one to Gentleman Jim Corbett. Gentleman Jim Corbett knocked him out in the 21st round and became the heavyweight champion of the world and gave the prize money to his church. Corbett had a motto, fight one more round. Fight one more round. If I had to end this and leave this with you, fight one more round. Get your convictions down into your spirit and decide you're going to fight one more round. No matter what's going on around you. Amen? I'm going to let gentleman Jim Corbett in my message before we sing this song. When your arms are so tired that you can hardly lift your hands to come on guard, fight one more round. When your nose is bleeding and your eyes are black and you are so tired that you wish your opponent would crack you on the jaw and put you to sleep, fight one more round. The man who fights one more round is never whipped. Never whipped don't quit God's not finished listen I am making a covenant with you in the presence of all your people I will perform miracles that have never been performed anywhere in all the earth in any nation and all the people around you will see the power of the Lord the awesome power I will display for you don't quit God's not finished let's stand together and sing this song
bowed and every eye closed. I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to the word of the Lord today. I believe what I said strongly, that the prophetic word embedded in my message today was don't give up the ground that you gained. If that resonated inside your spirit with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around. If that resonated to you personally and you say, Pastor, I don't want to give up the ground. That's what God's saying to me that I've gained. I'm going forward. Lift your hands up right now. Just get it up. All over this room, there's hands going up. Put your hands down. Thank you. I'm going to pray for you in a moment. Secondly, you want to stay coordinated with your season. You don't need to get, you don't need to be done with this season if it's not done with you. If that word meant something to you and encourages you today, just lift your hand right now. Just get it up. Who's it? That's good. Thank you. Father, you saw the hands in these two prophetic categories. Father, I declare in Jesus' name over these people. Lord, I pray I don't have to call them down to the front. I don't have to lay my hands on them. Holy Spirit, I believe you're big enough, strong enough, powerful enough that you will not let them leave these words. That, Lord, you will put them down on the inside of their spirit. And, Lord, it will badger them, bother them until they're obedient. And they will stay coordinated with their season. They will not give up the ground that they've gained. I thank you for it. I believe for it. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I need everybody, every eye up, every head up, up, every eye open looking at me. I believe that there's probably at least one, maybe more. Maybe it's online. Maybe it's in the room. Somebody needs to surrender to Jesus today. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer called the sinner's prayer. And we're all going to pray it together. Because you know what? We need to help one another. You know, but there's somebody here, somebody online maybe. You know, it's easy to give your life to Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this. If you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, you'll be saved. It's simple. But it's not always simple to live for God. That's why we need the body of Christ. Amen? So let's pray this prayer out loud, loudly, and together as I lead you. Say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for loving me that much. Thank you for pursuing me. I confess I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I invite you into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I want to live in forgiveness. I want to be a new person. I want the old things to go away. And I want my new life to start. So I receive Jesus today. Amen. If you're online and you prayed that prayer for the first time or you prayed it again because you're coming back to the Lord, just hit the link that's in the feed right there. If you're in this room, you say, Pastor, are you going to ask me to come down to the front? Not today, but I am going to ask you to raise your hand. I am going to ask you to make a public declaration. See, Jesus said this, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Heavenly Father. You need to tell somebody that I'm making a decision today. I'm going to count to three, and if you're in this room and you need to surrender your life to Jesus, you prayed that prayer, you meant it, you're serious about it, lift your hand up. One, two, three. There's one right there. Thank you, Dusty. Thank you back there. Thank you so much. Those are children. We believe it in the name of Jesus. Something different is going on. Amen? Amen.